Diana Brown is an assistant director in Safe Work Australia's psychosocial and consultation policy area. She joined Safe Work Australia in 2011 and is using her experience working with the model work health and safety laws to improve the way we address psychosocial hazards. Diana coordinates Safe Work Australia's mental health advisory group drawing on its experience and expertise from work health and safety authorities, industry bodies and unions to develop a model code of practice for managing psychosocial hazards at work. And indeed, her keynote presentation will pre examine precisely that, psychosocial hazards at work. Would you please join with me in welcoming Diana Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, as I said, my presentation is going to cover uh, psychosocial hazards and how we can manage them at work. So the vision of the Australian Work Health and Safety Strategy is in, underpinned by two key principles. The first is that all workers, regardless of their occupation or how they're engaged, have the right to a healthy and safe working environment. The second is that well-designed, healthy and safe work will allow workers in Australia to have more productive working lives. We strongly believe that not only do workers have the right to be safe from psychological injuries, but that ensuring their safety is also improves productivity and can offer positive returns to businesses. Our psychological injuries have a massive impact both on the worker and on the organisation. Um, workers' compensation data underrepresents psychological injuries, we know that for a number of reasons. Uh, but it does provide us with useful information on trends and comparisons between types of injuries. Safe Work Australia combine, so compiles the national data set for compensation-based statistics. From this data, we can see that the frequency rate, which is the number of claims per 100 million hours of work, for mental stress claims declined between 2002-03 and 2015-16, but in recent years. The rate for harassment and or bullying claims, uh, which is actually a subset of mental stress claims, has increased over that same period, reaching 17.5 claims per million hours of work in 2018-19. This is based on preliminary data, um, which may be updated as the claims come in and processed. The graph shows national figures, uh, including information from Victoria for the mental stress claims, that top grey line, uh, the harassment claims and Sorry, the harassment and bullying data, which is that lower red line, um, is a subset of the mental stress claims, but it excludes Victoria. Victoria doesn't um, code their data to that level of detail. We can also see from the data that while mental stress makes up only a small proportion of claims, the associated time lost and the costs are significantly higher. The bottom two uh, lines of this table um, so the total for mental stress claims compared to the totals for all claims. The bottom um, line, the total accepted claims, um, the median time lost is 0.8 of a working week, where for mental stress claims it's 12.2, so it's a massive difference there. Um, this shows that the, t that the cost and the impacts of this type of claim is much bigger for those affected. We also know that the money paid out as part of workers' compensation claims is only a fraction of the total cost of workplace injuries. And as I mentioned on the last slide, workers' compensation claims represent only a small fraction of injuries. The Australian Human Rights Commission in 2018 conducted the National Survey on Sexual Harassment, which revealed almost two in five women, which is 39%, and just over one in four men, 26%, had experienced sexual harassment in their workplace in the preceding five years. So that statistics represents just one type of psychosocial hazard, and I think it's scarily high. So what are we doing about it? Uh, the model work health and safety laws have covered psychological health as well as physical health since they were introduced in 2012 or 2013, depending on the state, it was 2013 in Tasmania. Um, but the public discourse around mental health has improved and there's better recognition that psychological injuries are preventable. Uh, I've only listed um, national milestones on this slide, um, but work health and safety regulators from across Australia have also been producing some really great resources on managing psychosocial risks, uh, particularly in the last couple of years. Safe Work Tasmania has a great web page which collects um, a range of resources on stress. 
In May this year, Work Health and Safety Ministers from the Commonwealth and all states and territories agreed to amend the Model Work Health and Safety Regulations to specifically address psychosocial hazards. And Safe Work Australia is also developing a model code of practice which will support and complement those regulations. These aren't going to change what a business needs to do to meet their work health and safety duties, but they will provide clarity on the existing duties and guidance on how to meet them. So have a look at what that actually involves. So psychosocial hazards are anything in the way we work, um, sorry, in the way work or jobs are designed, organised or managed, uh, the content of work, the tasks involved, working relationships and interactions, or the equipment or working environment that causes stress. Stress is a term we throw around a lot. It's our body's physical and psychological response when we perceive that demands on us exceed our ability or our resources to cope. Stress itself isn't an injury. Uh, in small amounts, it can actually be a good thing. So, for example, if you've got a tight deadline or high stakes, it can help you perform better. Um, but when stress becomes frequent, excessive or prolonged, it can do a serious harm. Common psychosocial hazards include job demands. Um, that covers working, uh, work requiring intense or sustained high physical, mental or emotional effort, uh, or unreasonable or excessive time pressures or role overload. Uh, violence or aggression, which is pretty self-explanatory, um, but it includes threats of those things. Uh, bullying, which is repeated unreasonable behaviour directed towards a worker or group of workers that causes a risk to health and safety. Bullying guidance has been around for a number of years, so most of you should be familiar with that definition. Uh, harassment, including sexual harassment. Conflict or poor working relationships and interactions, which can be from other workers, but can also come from customers, clients, patients. Um, traumatic events, uh, which is either being exposed to them directly or having to listen or view accounts um, from victims or witnesses. Uh, low job control, for example, a call centre worker um, who has to follow a prescriptive script and keep to really strict time frames for their calls. Uh, poor support, which includes the practical assistance and emotional support you get from a manager or um, your colleagues, but also includes inadequate tools or resources to do your job. Remote or isolated work, which goes back to that physical isolation from other workers um, and from assistants. Lack of role clarity, which can be uncertainty, frequent changes, conflicting roles or ambiguous responsibilities and expectations. Poor organisational change management, uh, inadequate reward and recognition. Poor organisational justice, which includes things like inconsistent application of uh, policies or discrimination. Um, or decisions that don't just don't align with, align with your normal policies. Uh, poor physical working environments, so things like loud noises, excessive heat or exposure to physical risks. You might see these hazards grouped or described differently depending on um, what you're looking at. I think most people are in furious agreement about what the hazards are, but they have different ways um, of how to group them and how best to describe them. So, for example, the new international standard um, groups traumatic events under job demands. Um, it's useful to know what all these hazards are um, and it might help you in identifying them and having common language to talk to workers about them. But if something's causing a worker stress, it doesn't need to be neatly categorised in order for us to control the risk. Uh, the risk management process should look really familiar to everyone. It's the same process we've been using for physical uh, risks for years. Psychosocial risks aren't distinctly separate from physical risks. Many hazards will have both a physical and a psychological element. So for example, isolated work or work-related violence. Treating them separately from your broader risk management process may actually create gaps. So I'm going to run through what the risk management process looks like for psychosocial risks. Um, but as much as possible, it should be included as part of your organisation's general risk management process. Uh, addressing psychosocial hazards separately is likely to create gaps, but also could miss opportunities. You might be able to find better ways to manage, more cheaper ways to manage them when you're managing them holistically. Uh, identifying hazards is the first step in our risk management cycle. 
Um, again, these should all look really familiar. We're using similar methods to identify psychosocial hazards as we do for physical hazards. The only difference for psychosocial hazards is that there may be more of them that you can't directly observe. Um, so consultation with your workers becomes really important. You're unlikely to be able to identify all psychosocial hazards or confidently say that they're not there unless you talk to workers. But open consultation isn't the only method for identification. Um, we know that workers may not report uh, work health and safety hazards for a range of reasons. For psychosocial hazards, this is exacerbated by the stigma around mental health and common misconceptions that if a worker is stressed by something at work, they just aren't resilient enough for the job. Uh, workers may also have privacy concerns or worry about potential ramifications if they're reporting a risk or behaviour um, of another worker. I'm going to touch on that a little bit more later. Um, think through the hazards and uh, the tasks, sorry, think through the tasks um, and identify any hazards involved in those. Review any direct reports about hazards. Businesses should have a system for reporting hazards and incidents, not just for psychosocial hazards, but generally. Um, it needs to suit the business size and circumstances and be proportional to the risk that the business faces. So for example, a small coffee shop um, might be as simple as having a whiteboard up in the kitchen where workers can write up any hazards they identify, uh, something like a locked box for making confidential reports, and a system like uh, reporting to the duty manager if there's a hazard that's um, posing an immediate risk to health or safety. Uh, a large business is going to need something much more sophisticated. As well as considering direct reports of hazards, you should consider what the data your business collects might show you about those hazards. So records of working hours um, can identify workers who are regularly working overtime um, and might show you that there's a high work demand there. Or your IT area might suddenly receive an increase uh, in reports of computer problems, which might show that your workers don't have the tools they need to do the job, which we discussed earlier was a form of poor support. You can observe the way your workers are behaving and interacting with each other. That might um, help you identify hazards such as bullying or harassment. But it's also important to remember that those can be a sign that other hazards are present but not adequately controlled. None of us are our best when we're feeling stressed uh, and some workers may respond with behaviour such as being a bit short or snappy with their colleagues. It's never an appropriate response. But where we see those behaviours, we should consider whether there's been another hazard present that we haven't adequately controlled. Uh, for larger businesses, anonymous surveys are a great tool for identifying hazards. Uh, work Health and Safety Regulators and Safe Work Australia recently developed the People at Work Psychosocial Risk Assessment Tool. Uh, it allows businesses with more than 20 workers uh, to conduct an anonymous survey of their workers and analyses the results. I'll give you a bit more of an overview of People at Work a little bit later. Next step is so assessing the risks. Uh, there are four things we want to look at to determine the risk associated with psychosocial hazard. The first is the duration, and that's how long a worker is exposed to a particular hazard. And a higher workload for a day or an hour will pose a much lower risk than facing that same workload for months on end. Our frequency, so how often is that hazard coming up? Severity. Uh, an office worker who has a high workload is likely to experience much less stress than an air traffic controller with the same sort of high workload. Uh, interaction. Uh, so hazards actually interact with each other uh, and can create more stress. So this is really important both when we're assessing the risk, but it can also help us when we're identifying control measures. If we imagine ourselves working in a call centre where you're receiving a really high volume of calls, and you have low levels of control over how you handle those calls. If you have great support, so a supervisor who's there to assist you if needed, and computers and systems that support your work, you might be able to cope with that high work demand. Now imagine the same job, but your supervisor is managing 100 other workers, so can't help you, and a computer that keeps on freezing, and your stress levels are likely to be much higher. You can see the interaction between the hazards. It does also mean that when it comes to controlling risks, if there's a particular hazard that we can't um, completely eliminate or can't do much about, we might still be able to minimise the risk by addressing the other hazards that are present.
The hierarchy of control measures should look really familiar to everyone. Uh, we can also use it for psychosocial hazards. The hierarchy is designed to help us find the most reliable and protective control measures. So we start at the top and only move down if we can't find reasonably practical control measures at that level. We must always eliminate risks if it's reasonably practical to do so. If it's not reasonably practical to eliminate them, then we must minimise them as far as it's reasonably practical. And this second tier is where we might need to apply a little bit more thought for psychosocial hazards. Minimising the risk can be achieved by altering systems of work, for example, allocating tasks to match skills, allowing sufficient time to complete tasks, increasing support from supervisors and other workers, uh, altering the workplace layout, altering the workplace environment, or changing objects and tools used for a task. Physical risks that are contributing to psychosocial risks can be minimised through the relevant substitution, isolation, and engineering controls. As with physical risks, the administrative controls and personal protective equipment are the least reliable controls and provide the lowest level of health and safety protection. We should only consider these last and use them in combination with more effective controls. The interaction between controls we discussed a minute ago is really important here. There are some jobs where we may not be able to completely eliminate exposure to a hazard. So for example, um, a police officer being exposed to violence. But by addressing the other hazards present, we can substantially decrease the worker's level of stress and therefore the risk that they're being exposed to. As to how we go about it, some controls are pretty obvious once we've identified the hazard. If you've identified low role clarity, you can go through a process of looking at the tasks in your workplace, mapping them to who's responsible, who they report to and the priorities and goals. Other control measures may not be as obvious or they might be specific to a workplace. And this is where consultation with workers can really assist. If you think about a time when you've been stressed at work, you can probably also think of something that would have helped or fixed the problem. In many cases, our workers are already going to have the answers. Now, a couple of principles to remember when we're controlling the risks. Uh, the first is that it's easier not to introduce a hazard in the first place than it is to deal with it later. If we have the opportunity to design our work, our systems and our workplaces so we don't introduce hazards, that will be most effective and it's usually going to be cheaper than trying to retrofit control measures later. The second is that control measures that apply to an entire organisation are likely to be more effective than those applying to an individual. So let's look at an industry example. I believe that the healthcare and social assistance industry is the largest employing industry in Tasmania. So we'll start there. Let's say we're a work health and safety manager for a hospital somewhere in Tasmania. A pandemic's just hit, um, dramatically increasing the number of patients we've got. So that's our high work demand. The system for ordering essential supplies has developed a bug. So our orders are arriving incomplete. And remember that not having the appropriate tools for the job is a form of low support. Patients are getting frustrated with delays and some are becoming aggressive. It isn't clear who in the hospital is responsible for managing elements of the response, so that's our low role clarity. You will notice in the guidance material for psychosocial hazards, there are examples of possible control measures, but we don't prescribe specific controls. For some hazards, there are generic controls um, that we can look at. In this example, uh, increasing the number of staff to reduce job, job demands or fixing that system fault to address the low support and defining roles and responsibilities will all help control those hazards. But there may be reasons that these can't be done immediately or there might be other controls that are more effective. This is where consulting with our workers becomes essential. In our example, uh, there might be an opportunity when patients are triaged to refer some cases to GPs or other services, which could both reduce the demands and possibly patient aggression if the information and options are provided um, early and possibly even before patients can arrive. Um, we might be able to confirm orders and essential supplies by email or phone, but maybe we could also look at options like stockpiling supplies and working with other health services nearby to do that. If we can't 
address the cause of patient aggression, we might be able to look at things like minimising the risk to our workers by altering the physical workplace. So for example, putting a counter between our staff and the patients, or where that isn't possible, changing the layout so workers can't become trapped and have a clear um, access to an exit. I don't and never have worked in healthcare, so I don't pretend to know the best control measures and what will be reasonably practical for that industry. But by consulting with workers in that area, I could draw on that expertise and find the best controls. Another example, if we think back to the call centre, uh, let's say we have a sudden spike in calls due to a new product causing high work demand. We've got staff who don't really know the new product, so are only able to follow prescriptive scripts, so they've got low job control. There's a lack of supervisors available to assist, which is causing low support, and customers are getting abusive because of the long wait times. It's still a psychosocial hazard if the abuse occurs over the phone or online. That's really important to consider. Um, it's not just the fact they could be physically harmed. Um, now, the best way to go about controlling the risk would be elimination. So starting at the top of that hierarchy of controls, not introducing that hazard in the first place. So it might be that we could dedicate more resources and careful consideration to a product before it's launched um, and actually prevent um, those hazards from cropping up and uh, eliminate them completely. But let's say for some reason that isn't reasonably practical. What might be reasonably practical to minimise these risks? Uh, for high job demand, we have identified that if we can't address it at source, uh, we might be able to increase the staff available. So let's have um, more workers, less work for each to do. Or we could have a system that prioritises the workload so workers can address the urgent issues. Uh, for example, a call centre, it might be that uh, call centre for a phone company, you could stop taking the calls for bill payments um, while you deal with that urgent demand, but then have an automated message advising that all payment deadlines have been um, extended. For low job control, it can be addressed by allowing staff more autonomy to apply the appropriate judgment, but that does require them to have the information and training they need to do that. Uh, for aggressive customers, we may be able to address the cause of the aggression. So for example, we might be able to provide information on wait times or provide options like callback services. We may be able to provide workers with de-escalation training uh, to recognise early when a customer is becoming abusive and prevent it escalating. But if we can't prevent the abuse, then control measures like allowing workers to hang up on abusive callers or escalating the call to a supervisor may work. But remember that those are sitting towards the bottom of our hierarchy of controls. They're less effective. Um, they're starting to look at administrative control measures. Control measures aren't a set and forget. Uh, the model work health and safety laws um, require reviews at certain points. So for example, when the control measure is not controlling the risks so far as it's reasonably practical, before a change at the workplace, it is likely to give rise to a new or different health and safety risk that the control measure may not effectively control. If a new hazard or risk is identified, if the results of consultation indicate a review is necessary, or if the health and safety representative requests a review because they reasonably believe one of the above has occurred and it's not been adequately reviewed already. You'll notice some of these triggers have an implicit requirement for you to be monitoring your workplace and your control measures um, so that you will pick up any new hazards or control measures that aren't working effectively. The monitoring review process shouldn't be a tick and flick. You need to have an appetite for bad news, uh, expect to find things that aren't working as well as possible or could be improved. Uh, if I was doing a regular routine review of my organisation's work health and safety systems and I wasn't finding things I could improve, I'd be really concerned that the process itself wasn't working. So a few frequent questions and problems we have with uh, managing psychosocial risks. Um, not addressing culture and stigma. So a negative culture or stigma towards mental health can be a massive barrier to workers identifying psychosocial hazards. There are a huge range of things that contribute to stigma. Um, some of them may not reflect the organisation or its leaders' beliefs. Uh, for example, using derogatory language or outdated language around mental health. 
Um, where stigma reflects our attitudes to mental health and psychosocial hazards, that can be much harder to change, but there are some really great resources out there uh, to help with that. Also, regularly consulting workers about psychosocial hazards as part of your broader work health and safety consultation process helps it to normalise those discussions and it shows the seriousness of it that it's being discussed as part of the broader work health and safety uh, process. Um, the focus on hazards and risks um, moves away and starts so by focusing on hazards and risks. Uh, it puts it uh, back on the work and rather than the individual, the worker. So it makes it easier for people to raise their concerns. Um, investigations. Um, where a complaint being made, for example, a bullying or sexual harassment complaint, investigations often focus only on the behaviour of individuals. So has somebody breached our code of conduct? What we should be doing is looking at whether there are hazards present which may have contributed to that behaviour and whether there are opportunities to improve control measures. For example, bullying might be an inappropriate response to other hazards, such as high work demands. Even where a worker or other person has behaved inappropriately, there may be opportunities to prevent similar incidents in the future. Um, so for example, where sexual harassment has occurred, there might be things we could change in the design or layout of the workplace to prevent it happening again. Um, focusing on individual resilience and wellbeing, um, so improving resilience of individuals can be really valuable. Um, I think for all of us, we've been through times where having um, those tools really, really helpful to us to improve our own mental health. Uh, but it doesn't replace prevention. Um, it doesn't prevent workers being exposed to hazards and it can only ever minimise the impacts. Uh, so no matter how resilient a worker is, any of us can be harmed by psychosocial hazards. It may take longer for some or it may the harm may not be as visible. Um, but workers all have differing reflex speeds, but none of us, I hope, um, would implement programs to improve our reflex times rather than putting proper guarding on our machinery. Some workers are stronger and more flexible than others, but we still aim to eliminate or minimise hazardous manual tasks in our workplaces rather than sending them off to the gym. Our focus for psychosocial hazards should similarly be on the hazard and not on the worker's response to it. Um, thinking that a bullying policy or an EAP is enough. These are both really useful tools and may be needed as part of a broader approach, but they don't replace a systematic approach to managing psychosocial hazards. An EAP can assist to minimise the impacts after a worker is exposed to a hazard, but it doesn't prevent that exposure. A bullying police policy is a great tool to set out your processes and assign responsibilities. Uh, for example, your policy could work through the risk management process and set out responsibilities at each step. It can also demonstrate your commitment to work health and safety and provide information for workers on how to report bullying or another hazard. But unless it's put into practice, it's just a piece of paper. If you choose to have a separate policy or policies for psychosocial hazards, I would encourage you to still incorporate them into the process for managing um, hazards generally in your workplace. Managing psychosocial hazards separately may miss opportunities to control them more effectively. So for example, if we were considering the lighting in our workplace um, and we'd identified that there's a trip hazard that we need to uh, have better lighting for, we might also be able to simultaneously address a risk of sexual harassment uh, if the lighting in the area and low visibility was an issue. Um, Common questions, so what do I do about a staff member with an existing mental health condition? If a worker chooses to disclose mental health conditions, then it may be reasonably practical to do more to manage the risks in that case. Or you may need to make reasonable adjustments uh, outside of work health and safety. WHS laws don't require businesses to be counsellors or to treat mental health conditions. Um, and if a worker chooses not to disclose a condition, you must still do everything that's reasonably pra practical to manage the psychosocial risks. What I would say though is that any risk management process or risk assessment that assumes all workers are uniformly healthy and fit is not adequate. There is, we know there is a level of people with mental health conditions in the workplace or people at different, um, different places on the mental health continuum and we need to account for that when we're managing psychosocial risks. Does this 
doesn't mean I can't manage underperformance. Uh, no, definitely not. Um, managing performance issues may be uncomfortable. Uh, it may even be stressful, but it would not be considered reasonably practical to completely avoid it. But you do need to be conscious of how you manage underperformance and you must eliminate or minimise any psychosocial hazards that are present. For example, um, low role clarity um, or not applying your policies consistently. So make sure the worker's job is really clear and that it's not that they've misunderstood something. Um, and if you're managing, applying a certain policy to manage somebody's performance, you need to apply that consistently across your organisation. I mentioned earlier the people at WorkTool. Um, so to support businesses managing psychosocial hazards, Safe Work Australia, Australian Work Health and Safety Regulators and leading researchers have collaborated to be develop um, the People at Work Psychosocial Risk Assessment Tool. Uh, the People at Work Tool is validated, evidence-based, robust and free for all Australian businesses. It helps identify key psychosocial hazards in the workplace and provides guidance on practical ways to manage them. The People at Work survey comes from a project we began back in 2007 and generated a validated survey to identify and assess psychosocial hazards in workplaces. It was originally a paper-based survey which had to be administered and interpreted by the workplace or they had to engage somebody to do so. Um, the People at Work tool takes this survey and builds it into a systematic process for businesses to manage psychosocial hazards. It provides support and resources through each step and is backed by support from Australian Work Health and Safety Regulators. The People at Work tool is available at www.peopleatwork.gov.au. Uh, for anyone who hasn't already gone and have a look, I'd encourage you to do so. It's really helpful, particularly it works for businesses for, with 20 plus workers. Um, really helpful will actually step you through that process, provides tools and support through each step. 